In this episode of The American Idea, Jeff meets with Dr. Jennifer Keene of Chapman University to discuss the far-reaching impacts of World War I on American politics, international standing, and domestic society, culture, and politics. I want to welcome you to this episode of The American Idea. Today we're going to be talking about a topic of historical importance, but also importance for America today and the way we understand our country and think about our country. We're going to be talking about the episode title, Uncle Sam Wants You, How World War I Changed America Forever. And I'm joined in that conversation today by Professor Jennifer Keene. Uh, Jennifer is a, a near and dear friend of the Ashbrook Center. She has been working with us on all kinds of programs for teachers. She is professor of history at Chapman University, where she is also the dean uh, in arts and sciences there and doing great work both in teaching scholarship and university administration. She wears lots of different hats. Uh, she is a terrific teacher, and she's taught a number of our Teaching American History seminars on the history of the early 20th century in America, World War I, and modern America. And she's also done, a, she's a terrific scholar. Uh, I want to commend to you her books, um, Doughboys, The Great War, and The Remaking of America, uh, which is one of the most important works in the field of uh, American World War I history. But I also want to commend to you her core documents collection. Um, World War II core documents put out by uh, Ashbrook and TAH Press. I want to thank Jennifer for that. And right now she's working on and near completion. I think the book is going to be soon. Uh, core docs volume on World War I and the 1920s. So Jennifer, thank you very much for all your contributions to scholarship and helping us understand this really important time in American history. Well, thank you. And thanks for such a generous introduction. <laughs> um, Look, World War One. I, I think people would say the wars that transformed America were the Civil War and World War Two. World War One often gets left out of that conversation. Why is that a mistake? I think it's a mistake because we're really seeing a transition in the First World War era where lots of the social problems that America has been grappling with during the progressive era, labor conflict, uh, racial violence, um, what role should the federal government play um, in, in American society? How should that role be transformed? Um, new political ideologies that seem to be challenging uh, democracy and capitalism as sort of the, the, the necessarily the vision of the future. All of this social unrest is occurring within the United States at the very moment that the First World War occurs. And so we see many different groups in American society believing that the war can become transformative by advancing what they want to see happen. So some of these activists and movements have more success than others, but it's a certainly a sort of pivotal area in excuse me, it's certainly a pivotal event in kind of setting up a lot of societal, cultural, political debates that are going to shape America throughout the rest of the 20th century. So remind us, uh, our listeners, of course, a lot of our listeners are uh, care deeply about American history, think and maybe even teach American history, but remind us of America's involvement in World War I. So the United States enters the war relatively late. We don't come into the war until April 1917. And of course, the war is over by November 11th, 1918. But only framing the First World War era around that relatively limited amount of direct involvement is a mistake. Because the United States, while it's neutral from August of 1914, when the war breaks out in Europe, um, while it's officially neutral, it is certainly involved. It's better to think of the United States as a non-belligerent than a neutral nation because we are directly involved in the conflict from the very beginning in terms of trade, in terms of um, Wilson trying to fashion a peace agreement, in terms of the war creeping ever closer to American shores. And then of course, if we look at the, the tail end, November 11th, 1918, well, because it takes until June of 1919 to actually negotiate out the Versailles Peace Treaty, 
And then heading into the summer, a big debate over ratification, we can see that even in the post-war period, there's a lot of political discussion about what America's role in the world is going to be. And again, as I was sort of mentioning before, a lot of social unrest as the United States has to shift very quickly from mobilizing resources to demobilizing them. So what I'm essentially saying is while the American involvement looks like it's only about 19 months, in fact, it really spans a five-year period. And is it fair to say, and I've heard some historians make this argument, that over that five-year period, America, and I know this is a broad generalization, but America begins its transformation from a not modern country to a modern industrialized democratic country. Is that fair or would you say there's uh, more to that picture? I think it's definitely fair. And I think it really revolves around your definition of modern. So when we think about modern America, we think of an America that plays a leading role in the world, that is both an economic powerhouse, that um, is an, an inspiration in terms of its political ideals, that it aims to uh, use its influence for good in the world. Uh, when we think about modern, I think we think about the extension of rights, um, political rights, civil rights. Uh, we think about things like women having the right to vote and the, the modern civil rights movement, which does have successes from the midpoint on in the 20th century. Um, we think about a federal government that does play an active role in the lives of most Americans. This is not, the federal government has very little presence in the lives of most Americans before the World War I era. So we start seeing um, the, all these characteristics that we associate with modern America taking root and taking shape in the World War I era. And that's what makes it such a pivotal point because it's not that everything is done and dusted, but just as we live in the shadow of the Civil War and what was accomplished and what was not accomplished, I think we also live in the shadow of the First World War because we see so many of these aspects of modern America taking shape and the divisions over, over, over these transformations continue to animate American society and politics well into the 20th century. So let's take a, a, a narrow in on a couple of those points that you mentioned. You mentioned um, the, the trends that we started to see in World War I that accelerated became part of mo modern America and that, of course, continue with us today. Uh, you mentioned uh, labor issues, race issues, uh, the role of the federal government and some of these new political ideologies. Um, maybe we just take take the role of the federal government. How does World War I change that? It changes it in the in the terms of fighting the war very, very dramatically. This is a war effort that is going to be um, this is really going to centralize power within the federal government to mobilize America to to fight. Uh, mobilizing economic resources, um, manpower resources, um, public opinion, and and really taking the power to direct these things um, through coercion and force if people do not actually agree to make those transformations voluntarily. So what do I mean by that? Well, for the very first time, the United States will, will raise a mass conscripted army right from the very beginning of the conflict um, in order to get the millions of men that it believes it needs to fight successfully on the Western Front. Um, the government will create an organization, the Committee on Public Information, to orchestrate uh, a, a, a nationwide propaganda campaign about why people should support this war and what they can do to support the war effort, something we've never seen before. Um, we have new sedition legislation, um, the Espionage Act in 1917, that's quickly followed by the Sedition Act in 1918, which really curtails freedom of speech. What can you say? What is considered treasonous speech? What's going to potentially land you, land you in, in jail? And we see in order to enforce that legislation, 
of the Justice Department beginning to expand investigative powers, which will, so will soon thereafter give birth to the, to the FBI. And so these are just like a, few, a handful of things where we can start to see that the, the power that the government begins to exert in order to direct the war effort starts having, I think, just in probably as I was talking, people could tick off in their mind how those trends are going to um, develop and be exaggerated even further in the 20th century. Having said all of that, I also want to add that it was not possible for the federal government within you know, a matter of months to turn from a relatively benign force to an all-powerful force in people's lives. There was a lot of help on the ground from localities, from states in helping grow that federal power. Um, a good example is the uh, Espionage Act, right? The, the Justice Department does not have the capabilities to go into all communities and start investigating reports of possible sedition. They're relying on local communities to sort of police themselves and, and, and essentially inform on each other when they believe that there is serious cases of, of uh, treason uh, occurring. Uh, likewise with conscription. I mean, conscription gets the demand for men gets funneled down through the state, through the councils of national defense, uh, to uh, local communities where local draft boards will do the selecting of who goes and who doesn't who doesn't go. So the reason I'm bringing this up, it's kind of a long answer, is that you know progressives have an idea of government efficiency, and they really do believe that there's a kind of rational way that you can devise policy and then implement it, and and you can do it sort of fairly and equitably without passion. But but the way that the United States develops a kind of hybrid mobilization model of setting those policies at the top, but really having to rely on local communities to enforce and support, we start seeing lots of inequities you know, throughout this process. And local decisions about race, about about um, about gender, about uh, about labor unions, about all these things that begin to impact how the mobilization occurs. I mean, I think that we're we were left with that today, that yes, we have a much stronger federal government than we certainly did in 1916. But at the same time, the states exert a lot of power as well. And sometimes they're working in cooperation and sometimes they're at odds with each other. And I think this is this is a dynamic that we can definitely see taking root uh, in the World War I era. Yeah, it's it's noteworthy to me, too, when you just think about, you know, uh, Uncle Sam wants you, the poster. I'm just thinking of that poster. I think most Americans would say, oh, yeah, that obviously came from World War II. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a funny one because that that poster was uh, by James Montgomery Flagg was actually initially created before America was in the war in 1916. And it was it was the cover of a magazine, Leslie's uh, weekly magazine. And it and he used himself as a model for Uncle Sam and the and the and the real uh, and the caption was, what are you doing for preparedness? And this was this was from a group that really wanted us to think about, you know, starting to build an army a lot sooner than we than we ended up doing. And then, of course, the government loves it, picks it up, distributes millions of these posters and it's copied in World War II. So it comes into being again because it's such a, a such a powerful symbol and this idea that. Um, you know, sort of a stern Uncle Sam telling you what what you need to do in terms of in terms of joining the military. But yeah, even there, you see very clearly the the links between between the two wars. Um, uh, the issue of race, which obviously it gets intertwined with many issues. How does World War One again? We if if you were to say the Civil War, I certainly understand how the Civil War changes the racial situation in the United States. You see, World War II, people think of uh, Tuskegee Airmen. They think of desegregation of the armed forces after World War II. Um, they see the beginnings of racial changes in the civil rights movement that comes out of World War II and that era. How does World War I play a role in America's racial situation? Well, that's a big question, and I'll say a few things. The first is that there, of course, was great hope 
within the African-American community when Wilson proclaims in his war address that this is a war, that the world must be made safe for democracy, that this can also have an impact within the United States. And taking this rhetoric and holding America accountable while African-Americans demonstrate loyal loyalty to, to the nation in terms of both serving in the military, but also, you know, volunteering at home to support to support the war effort, that these will be acts that are rewarded with an advancement of civil rights. And in having this hope, uh, we can see the African American community looking back on the Civil War. And, you know, Frederick Douglass encouraging Black men to, to fight, fight for the Union even though there was still support for slavery and still no, you know, an Emancipation Proclamation that had, that had nothing to say about the border states, but arguing that if, if you know, black men had to fight it for freedom to end slavery, and this would be a way of guaranteeing their full inclusion um, in the polity. And a similar argument is made during the First World War, and we can say unequivocally that those hopes are dashed. Uh, that that's not what happens, that despite African Americans stepping up and joining and fighting and participating, that not only are civil rights not advanced, but this is probably one of the worst periods in race relations in American history. Post really? Why, why is that? What happens? I think that, well, first of all, there is unbelievable racial violence within the United States from 1917 through 1919. Part of it, part of the pre, uh, pre-America pre entry um, uh, to the war, uh, violence uh, occurs as a result of the Great Migration, where we see African Americans taking advantage of opportunities to leave the South and come and work in the North where new uh, industrial jobs are opening up to them because the war has curtailed immigration from Europe. We see the scourge of lynching, which really um, has just you know been accelerating over the years, just again, um, uh, explode to unseen proportions uh, during this period. Um, and so, we see, and then we see when black soldiers begin coming home, a concern that the, the relative social liberties and welcoming environment that black soldiers have enjoyed in France from white French civilians, especially French women, will have put ideas in people's heads about challenging the status quo and to ensure that you know there's no mistake made in people's minds that that nothing that things are going to change um we see an explosion of violence <clears throat> specifically against against returning soldiers so all of these things between the 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 changing demographics in some cities the sense of of exaggerated labor tensions because black migrants were often accused of being strike breakers um the 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 kind of sense of, of of Southerners fearful of losing their labor force, and then the idea that that the that blacks might actually um, be right that the war is a transformative moment in race relations, and and that fear that it instills all kind of lead to this this explosion so much so that James Weldon Johnson actually calls 1919 the Red Summer of 1919 which is a moniker that kind of encapsulates this very violent moment. And, and so these are, these are things and they're cautions for us to kind of, of realize that wars can transform things and they can transform things for the worst. They're not necessarily always transformations that we can say are positive. But there, there are some silver linings, and the silver lining, I would say, is that what we do also see within the African-American community is a shift in ideology. And here is where the roots of the modern civil rights movement really are sown. So if we think of the pre-war civil rights movement really revolving around Tuskegee and Booker T. Washington and a more gradualist accommodationist approach and a fledgling organization like the NAACP beginning to really press for civ immediate civic rights for integration. Um, but the, the NAACP is a very small organization before the war. 
But the new experiences, the new worldview, the new uh, a sense of urgency that many African-American leaders and Amer African-American veterans begin to have as a result of the war means that they accelerate the NAACP and its integrationist vision. They push even to some more um, radical ideologies like Marcus Garvey and the idea of, of, of Black empowerment, but that going in hand in hand with Black, black military strength or even uh, a sort of Pan-African view of, of Black peoples of the world uniting to sort of fight, fight their oppressors. And so we really begin to see a real shift in tactics in the civil rights movement and in ideology. And we can't say that in 1920, 1921, there's a lot of movement or a lot of success, but many historians have argued, and I'm among them, that you don't get to the 1950s and board versus Brown versus Board of Education and the, all the kind of greatest hits of the civil rights movement that we're so familiar with, you don't get there without what happens in in, in, the, in the first world war period. You mm -hmm. have to start somewhere and and those sow the seeds that later generations pick up and we see, we see the successes coming. Before we continue with our conversation, I'd like to have one of our faculty members tell you about a special documents-based graduate program for teachers of American history, government, and civics. Hi, this is John Moser, Chair of the Master of Arts in American History and Government program at Ashland University. If you are an educator who teaches U.S. history, government, or politics, our program may be just what you've been looking for. Our approach is to emphasize primary sources, since we think the best way to study the past is to read the words of those who lived it. We have a distinguished faculty made up of professors from both Ashland University and from colleges and universities across the country. And they're not there to lecture to you. We think it's better to learn through conversation about the documents. Ours is a hybrid program with two different types of seminar. The first are our week-long intensive in-person courses during the summers on the beautiful campus of Ashland University. The second are our live synchronous online seminars offered throughout the year. So if you're a social studies teacher and you're looking to deepen your understanding of America's past and its politics, please check out the Master of Arts in American History and Government program. You can do that by visiting tah.org slash programs. What about some of the more, I mean, that's fascinating because I think then about some of the other social movements at the time, for example, women's suffrage movement, right? which seemed like it was going to take get some steam right after the Civil War. And as we all know, it doesn't. It goes into a, a relative period of, of, of not having success for decades. Um, what uh, role does World War I play in the advancement of civil rights for women? So the, the female suffrage movement obviously has more success because we do end up with the 19th Amendment in 1920. And we can't say the First World War alone is responsible for that success, but the First World War does play a, an important role. The first thing that it does is it really, it really heightens the visibility of the movement because women are actually essential to mobilization and their support is essential in so many capacities. As mothers, are they going to be willing to let their sons go off to fight as women control the domestic uh, food economies? So when you try to have food conservation efforts, are they going to actually go along? Um, women become very visible in campaigns like knitting and victory gardens and selling war bonds and, and also to even work in factories to take the place of men who are who are being conscripted into, into service. So the cooperation of women and the mobilization of women is very, very essential. And the and the female suffrage movement takes advantage of this. And and there there's two separate factions of the movement, but the more moderate faction um, led by Carrie Chapman Catt really urges women to, uh, to volunteer wholeheartedly for the war effort and, and through their volunteer efforts, really work at promoting the cause of suffrage. And, and, and she does this by arguing rhetorically that you cannot be asking women to be accepting all the responsibilities of citizenship without bestowing upon them the rights of citizenship. And in this ideological moment where democracy is being 
pushed so strongly as the purpose of the war, this is an argument that has legs. But there's also another faction of the movement, a more radical side, the National Women's Party led by Alice Paul, which takes a very different tactic. And they had begun, even before the United States was in the war, um, in January of 1917, they pioneered a new protest tactic, which is going to sound so tame to us now, but at the time was considered really just unbelievable. Okay. <laughs> which was that they picketed the White House. <laughs> and they were the first to stand out there, but this really outraged people. And in the beginning, nobody paid them a lot of attention. Um, they were sort of more annoying than anything else. But once we entered the war, they got a lot of attention because they stood out there with their signs, you know, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? And then the signs kind of escalated in essentially calling out Wilson as a hypocrite here. You know, you say that we're fighting for democracy. Women don't have the right to vote at home. And instead of just ignoring them, um, the they, the administration um, uh, ends up confronting them. And so these women get arrested uh, for uh, obstructing traffic in a public way, basically taking huh. up on the sidewalk. But they get put in jail. And because these women are highly educated and they're, many of them are quite powerfully connected, a lot of them are, are upper class women with powerful husbands, what happens to them in jail gets publicized. And when Alice Paul very famously goes on a hunger strike and then is force fed, and the idea that you know this 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 very young, very attractive woman is being handled mishandled in this terrible way, um, also begins to ga garner sympathy um, for the for the movement. And the two factions they don't agree on tactics. Cat thinks that that you know Paul is making things worse, and Paul thinks that Cat you know is selling out. They both want a federal amendment. They try these different ways to get there. And I think what historians would say is both of these things mattered um, because the bad publicity, these women have to be let out and it kind of pressure puts pressure on Wilson and then Kat puts a different kind of pressure on him. And the upshot is that in the fall of 1918, Woodrow Wilson becomes the first sitting president to openly support female suffrage and a, and a female suffrage amendment to the constitution. And so, and then bit by bit, you start seeing the political lobbying uh, being more effective behind the scenes. Of course, there's a behind the scenes game that's going on as, as well. And so in that sense, I think that the first world war offers different opportunities to the movement. It helps publicize the movement and it gives, it gives them the ability to attach their cause to Wilsonian rhetoric. And that's what I think we really have to understand. The civil rights movement does exactly the same thing, much less successfully than the, than the female suffrage movement does. But Wilson's rhetoric really opens up a lot of opportunities for a lot of groups in American society to claim their stake to full citizenship. And another group that we often overlook that I'm going to also want to mention are immigrants, because many immigrants live before the war in ethnic enclaves. And they don't have a lot of opportunity to really join in with so-called mainstream American society. But immigrants are not ignored during the war. They can't be. One out of every five soldiers in the American army is foreign born. There's concerns about loyalty within the immigrant population. Um, and so all of these things that we think about, about being conscripted, about serving on committees, about buying liberty bonds, about about really demonstrating your patriotism, this reaches into immigrant communities as well and really accelerates assimilation within these communities. And a lot of immigrants are thankful for, for this. They see it as an opportunity for them to demonstrate their, their loyalty to their adopted country. And, and so it does in some cases, like for German Americans, result in a sort of disillusion of that specific culture, because of course, that's a culture connected to the enemy we're fighting. But for a lot of others, it helps them feel American for the very first time. And so this idea that this is a moment where we too can be full citizens, we see that in a variety of different capacities. Um, uh, it's fascinating that, you say right. that because I'm, I'm from a I'm from Western Michigan, and there's a town in Western Michigan that was settled by German uh, immigrants, uh, which they named Berlin. 
But as a result of during World War One, they renamed it to modern. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, to, you see a lot of that. Prove their right? Americanness. Yes, exactly. And again, there, there's like the the there's both the voluntary part, but also people doing these things for their own personal safety. I mean, the sense of people changing their names or changing the town or, um, you know, German language uh, instruction, you know, almost evaporates in the school system. You start seeing um, uh, lots of of of. Um, of uh, what was I going to say? Sp of German language publications uh, shut down. So there's 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 definitely a way in which it's an opportunity to to, to assimilate and prove Americanness. There's also a real cultural loss in in some ways, especially with language and and customs. Um, what about the broader? You you also mentioned labor and labor conflicts and labor issues, and it does seem to me when I think about uh, 20th century. And the, the importance and power of the labor movement, it seems like the labor movement is not that strong before World War I, but after World War I and then on into the mid-20th century, labor seems to grow as a power in American society. Does World War I have a catalyzing effect on the labor movement? I think that the, for the first world in the first world war, what it sort of demonstrates to labor is that if you have the government on your side, it actually can be beneficial for you. I think before the first world war, the preferred stance of most labor unions was just to keep the government out of it, because whenever the government came in, it usually was to break a strike or to you know reopen a factory. It was you know reopen the railroads. It wasn't really to help labor in their collective bargaining. Um, but in the First World War, you do see that the um, in, in there is there are clauses in government contracts to protect the right to organize unions and and a government uh, you know labor relations board created where people can actually submit grievances in case they think that the employers are breaking the rules, and it does help union membership grow. And so for unions like the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, which is mostly for skilled white workers, they do see, you know, labor unions growing and and that this government backing, if, if companies are taking government contracts, actually helps them, helps them in terms of organizing. However, again, because there's a growing suspicion of radical ideologies for those labor unions that are more associated with either socialism or communism um, or, or even anarchism, those labor unions don't do so well. So something like the IWW, which is essentially crushed during, during the war. And so coming out of it, I think what we see is that while there is um, a growth during the war in terms of union membership, and 1919 is also a record year, not just for racial violence, but for the number of labor strikes that that exists throughout the country. Very quickly, the, the 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 range of ideological perspectives within the within the labor movement that we see has been curtailed. So a lot of these very left unions, even the socialists, have a really hard time after the war. And if you think of the socialists, I mean, they were not just a, a union movement, but they were also a political party. And, and and a strong political party <laughs> before the war, and there are none of those things um, in the 1920s. Hmm. So labor's fortunes, like like many, is a little a little mixed. But what it does show us going into the New Deal, when we think about the significant labor legislation that has passed during during the New New Deal, that 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 idea that the government, if it's on labor's side, can actually have a positive impact. That that I that that perspective has been laid during the experience of the First World War. Um, what about the effect of World War One on the American psyche? I mean, you think of uh, the people think of the lost generation, think of the sort of uh, the idea before World War One that so many people, certainly in Europe, had of kind of uh, infinite progress. We're on the high road to progress. We're getting better materially morally, spiritually, mankind is headed for a, a positive future. And World War I has such a shattering effect on many people, thinking of writers in, in Europe. Uh, Ernest Hemingway in the United States seemed deeply affected by World War I and this notion of, are we really going to make progress as a country or as a civilization? 
What about the kind of psychological or spiritual effect of World War One? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I, I think that uniformly, there is a sense of disillusionment after the war in American society. And it's not to say that people are not individually proud of maybe the part that they played or serving their country loyally in time of war, but the expectations were so high of the war. By the time the United States came in, there was a sense of people latching on to Wilson's vision as the one thing that could make this terrible war worth it. Because by the time, you know, the U.S. comes in, there's already been plenty of bloodshed. I mean, this is after the Somme, it's after Verdun, and it's it's the sense that the the, the war has been so catastrophic and so costly, what could be worth this cost? And the idea that, that Wilson presents is, you know, the war to end all wars, this idea of spreading democracy, that, that, that there's going to be a league of nations where we're going to, you know, come to, to, to our arbitrate disputes and we'll never have to have this kind of cataclysmic experience again. And probably one of the first you know, signs that there's going to be problems making this happen um, is the Russian Revolution. So if you want to think, honestly, if you want to think about the First World War and why it's important, that's all you probably only have to cite the Russian Revolution. We and shouldn't you, forget and, that, right? <laughs> and it's like case closed. Like you just don't even have to go go any farther than that. And I think the second sign was the very harsh a peace that was imposed on Germany um, after after the war. The idea that that you know, because Wilson has not just his war address, and now I'm referencing documents in the core documents book for the teachers out there. But we think of the war address and then how he elaborates on these principles in the 14 points, where he's sort of got like you know, here's the game plan, people. Okay, first we're going to do this, and then we're going to have freedom of the seas, and then we're going to have open covenants of peace and then I'm not listing them in order so does it then we're going to have um we're going to have no trade barriers we're going to have you know equitable adjustment of colonial claims and he kind of goes through all the all this stuff and and then you know when you get to the peace treaty you just start seeing all the ways that 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 vision has not real has not been enacted and so so you you got it, you get a sense and then just lay on top of that all the expectations that Americans had, right? That we were just talking about a second ago. And you're kind of setting yourself up for just massive disappointment in the in the post-war period because the world has not been remade perfectly in a way that's going to guarantee peace, prosperity, happiness, and equality for all peoples throughout out the world. And and so in that sense, there it was almost inevitable that, that there would be disillusionment. But I think that disillusionment specifically within the United States had to do also with their with America's hesitancy. And we we've seen this in our own time very clearly, hesitancy with playing this active role in the world as the world's you know, superpower, economic powerhouse, and beacon of, of democracy and ideological ideological principle. And Americans have, are always uneasy about this. And, and Wilson was so such a strong advocate of, of, you know, of America playing this role. And of course, we know that many who disputed his vision, you know, helped ensure that the Versailles Peace Treaty was never ratified. And so that ambiguity, I think, also, you know, had a very particular, uh, um, or this disillusionment had a very political, a very particular uh, impact within the United States. And we think of of Hemingway and the lost generation of writers is really articulating that, but we should also look to the US Congress because when we get to the 1930s and we see like the, the Nye Commission, you know, investigating war profiteering and did we really just get into this war so that the uh, our war loans could be repaid, you know, so bankers were behind it and industrialists were behind it. And this is just another example of the exploitation of the American people by the financial and industrial elites, right? So very much a class analysis 
of and critique of why America got into the war. And then the neutrality legislation that the Congress passed is again kind of speaking to this idea that there was just a small group of people that pulled us into this conflict, um, you know, around this 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 mirage of freedom of the seas being the most important thing that America, a principle that America had had to protect. And that's very powerful. And we know how powerful because it prevents the United States from getting in, directly involved in the Second World War for nearly three years. And, and again, becomes a very powerful critique against America playing a major role in the on the European content to, to address European quarrels. It's not that we're against a role in the world. We've got plenty of intervention in our own hemisphere, Obviously, we have we're expanding our colonial influence in the in the Pacific. When it comes to a direct involvement in Europe, there's a lot of hesitancy um, as a result of the experience of the First World War. It's interesting you say that, and the resonance for today, because even today, um, Wilsonian that adjective to describe foreign policy in both political parties is widely attacked as a bad thing, as a kind of naive utopian, get America involved in all kinds of conflicts it shouldn't be involved in, people still bring up the ghost of Woodrow Wilson as a cautionary tale in their minds for America's role in the world. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you know, in in the period leading up to the Second World War, FDR, of course, had a different uh, way to invoke Wilson. It was our great father, Woodrow Wilson, who actually saw the way and we didn't follow through on his on his vision. And and now it's time to do it right. And if you think about, you know, how we come out of the Second World War with the United Nations, with the idea of with the Atlantic Charter, I mean, you know, these are things that are built on Wilsonian principles. I mean, they're they're a little punchier and, you know, he was a better politician than, than Wilson. But at the end of the day, we did end up with the Wilsonian world and we still live in a Wilsonian world. And probably the only time where we were really, you know, ch you know challenged in terms of thinking about whether we were, were now ready um, almost a century later to chart a different course, I think was during the first, was during the, the the Trump administration. I mean, because then you really did have, and I made this argument at the time, sort of for the first time, the power of the presidency and uh, or a person with the power of the presidency who really rejected Wilsonianism. And I think other presidents, maybe it's a it's it's a it's a convenient political football, but at the end of the day, that's the vision we continually enact again and again and again. I mean, when, you know, I don't have to get into too much of the present day, but, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, I mean, you know, we can just go on and on. It's, yeah. you know, Ukraine, like, among others. Yeah, Ukraine, that's, that's, I that's mean, a fascinating point because it yeah. makes me and it makes me ask this question. And maybe it's an unfair question to a historian, but um Woodrow Wilson was obviously, you've talked about him many times in this conversation and mentioned him, and his legacy continues to be disputed today. And, and uh, do we live in a Wilsonian world? Yes. Should we reject it? Yes. No. There's arguments about that. History's verdict on Woodrow Wilson. Yeah, that's... <laughs> well... Woodrow Wilson is a very controversial figure. I mean, there's obviously, I think, the, a lot of the, the the very legitimate negativity around Woodrow Wilson at the moment has as much to do with his racial politics as it does with his foreign policy. And I think we've seen a lot of people uh, really trying to come to terms with the way when I was speaking earlier about the fact that race relations got worse and the situation for African Americans got worse within the United States, a lot of that can be laid at the feet of Woodrow Wilson in terms of policies that, that he enacted and, and also things that he did not do. Um, and clearly with the, um, the sense of, of, you know, Wilsonian foreign policies, um, the, the whether or not they're viable and whether or not they're ideal, too idealistic or are actually realistic, I do think there's an argument to be made that Wilson was very realistic in terms of what he what he was proposing, because he was really proposing to remake the world, not only in America's image, but remake the world in a way that served America's interests. 
that at the time, in terms of the geopolitical environment in which he lived, it actually, many of the things he proposed in the 14, 14 points actually benefited the United States at the, to the detriment of other, of other nations, which is, of course, part of the reason why they also didn't work. Didn't work. So now I've lost track of the question. <laughs> well, it sounds like it's a so well. It sounds like it's a mixed verdict on Woodrow. It's Wilson. a mixed verdict. I would say you can't. You have to grapple with what Woodrow Wilson. You can't understand 20th century America if you don't grapple with Woodrow Wilson. So you know he's a person. I obviously can tell I have my own mixed feelings about him. There's sometimes I find him quite inspiring. He did write great speeches. I, and the other times that I find him despicable and and infuriating, but I never doubt his impact. And that's what we as historians have to kind of remember that we may disagree with an historical figure and we may not even like them, but if they were impactful, we have to try to understand them and we have to try to understand their 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 influence. Um, because well, that, that, that is a absolutely fantastic lesson for us all to remember <laughs> yes. in thinking about history, right? Yeah. To think about the significance of trying to understand them as they understood themselves and the impact that they had on the world. Obviously, World War I continues to, it shaped America profoundly in the rest of the 20th century. And I think you made a pretty compelling case today that it continues to shape America even in the 21st century. Well, then Jennifer. my job is done. <laughs> <laughs> and you did it well. Jennifer, thanks for taking the time to join us today on The American Idea. We really appreciate it. Great. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to this episode of The American Idea. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to subscribe at Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and leave a five-star review. If you want to learn more or get involved in Ashbrook's vital work, visit our website, ashbrook.org.